And the Wagner Group is what is leading Putin's war right now. Right now, it, making the only known progress on the battlefield for Putin. That means the man running Russia's most powerful private army is making a name for himself. Here is Evgeny Prigozhin publicly declaring that his men are the ones who captured a town just outside the key city of Bakhmut. We can safely say that the settlement of Klishivka, which is one of the most important suburbs of Bakhmut, has been completely taken under the control of Wagner PMC units, exclusively by Wagner PMC units. Klishivka has been liberated. It's incredible, exclusively by Wagner. Wagner is not the Russian defense. It's not the Russian military. It's a separate group. And he's emphasizing this word exclusively, that it was he and not they. And he's taking it even further than that. He has been openly criticizing Russia's official military leaders. I have had the deepest combat experience for eight years now, in many ways vastly superior to the experience of those who have been in the service of the defense ministry for decades. It's incredible, right? And what is most incredible about all of that is if Vladimir Putin appears to be completely fine with it. And maybe that's why Russian politicians are also happy to back Prigozhin in a sort of Prigozhin versus the Russian military institution. Just look at this picture from the prominent Russian lawmaker Sergei Miranov. So you see him there. He is holding a sledgehammer. It is a Wagner sledgehammer. This is a very provocative picture because Wagner boasts about having the sledgehammer as their official symbol. So why? Why? Because a sledgehammer was used to murder a Wagner Group fighter who tried to flee the battlefield last year. And now look at him there, brandishing it. And while Russia's official military suffers from a lack of pretty much everything, as basic as ammunition when it comes to fighting, Prigozhin has, is, appears to be getting more weapons, sort of their completely own supply chain. Take a look at these pictures. I'm going to show you this. These we understand to be images of what appear to be Russian rail cars traveling to North Korea, picking up infantry rockets and missiles. Weapons that, according to the United States, then went straight to Prigozhin's and Wagner fighters in Ukraine. And the concern tonight is that North Korea might deliver even more lethal military equipment to Prigozhin specifically. Ben Wiedemann is out front live in Kramatorsk, Ukraine. And Ben, you're there on the ground in Bakhmut today where some of the fiercest fighting is taking place. You hear uh, Prigozhin claiming victory in a suburb of Bakhmut. What did you see in here? Well, Aaron, we've been going to Bakhmut fairly regularly for the past two and a half weeks or so. And uh, what we're seeing is that the fighting is just getting more and more intense and that the Russian noose around Bakhmut is tightening. In the trenches outside Bakhmut, a mortar crew is at work. Withdrawal. Hoping to repel Russian forces on the verge of encircling the city. Drone footage shows the impact of their rounds on enemy positions. The refrain among these troops, we need more. Oh, all speaks about tanks, tanks, tanks. Yes, of course, tanks. It's most powerful for our time machines on the field. But now it's 21st century. We need not only tanks, we need the aviation. Around Bakhmut, slowly and steadily, the Russians are gaining ground. Thursday, Evgeny Prigozhin, head of the Wagner Group, claimed his troops, and only his troops, took the village of Klishivka, just south of the city. In a dugout, this officer, nicknamed Koleso, explains Wagner's tactics. They attack at night. The first wave is less trained, but we have to use lots of ammunition against them, he says. The next wave of troops has night vision, is better trained and better equipped. Tactics seemingly from a different day and age, inflicting mounting casualties on Ukrainian forces. This soldier was critically wounded when his armored personnel carrier was struck by Russian fire. Much of Bakhmut is now a ghost town, the sound of shelling, the danger constant. We're 
inside this tunnel inside Bakhmut, taking cover because there's incoming rounds just nearby. The few civilians left resigned to their fate. People die from strikes everywhere in Kyiv and Dnipro, says Valentina. If that's your destiny, death will reach you anywhere. On a hill above the city, a Soviet-era T-72 tank fires into the distance. Its sound and fury, perhaps not enough to turn the tide. And that tank, uh, that T-72 tank, is more than 50 years old. Uh, we've seen other artillery, for instance, uh, that dates back to 1950, older than me. Uh, and this is why the Ukrainians are so insistent that they need modern weapons to fight uh, the Russians. And we heard the deputy defense minister of Ukraine say today uh, that Ukraine is disappointed with the German hesitance to provide them with these Leopard 2 tanks. And they say they really need these weapons and they need them now. Yeah. Amazing how many of those uh, ancient by any, any, any measure here in modern warfare uh, yeah. weapons. Uh, they want those cluster uh, precision munitions. They want all of it. Thank you so much, Ben Wiedemann. And now, retired Air Force Colonel Cedric Layton and Peter uh, Rao, who just wrote an extensive article about Wagner Group Chief Evgeny Prigozhin. He's director of the Hudson Institute Center on Europe and Asia. Colonel Layton, let me start with you. When you hear Ben talking about Bakhmut, where he spent so much time, and saying Russia is slowly and steadily gaining ground. You know, you hear Prigozhin today claiming uh, that he exclusively, right, took, uh, took a suburb, uh, a village south of the city of Bakhmut. How significant is the Russian performance here? I mean, we understood, you know, Soledar, that was, it was very clear, was, was of marginal to no strategic importance. Bakhmut is different. Yeah, it sure is, Aaron. And the key thing here is that although Bakhmut is not the center of great industry or the center of a military base, it is astride one of the main highways that leads into eastern Ukraine. And so because of that, and also because of the symbolic nature that both sides have really made of this uh, this this town, uh, the idea here for the Russians is to capture it at any price. Uh, they don't really care what they're capturing. The main fact is that they're capturing something. And so Bakhmut has become this kind of a symbol uh, for mm -hmm. both the Russians and for the Ukrainians. For the Ukrainians, it's basically a symbol of resistance. For the Russians, it's a symbol, they hope, of their victory uh, in the future and in, in uh, weeks to come. Right, to have any kind of a victory. And of course, uh, within Russia, you've got the Russian military and you've got the uh, Wagner group uh, led by Evgeny Prigozhin. So you've got, you've got this war going on inside uh, Russia's military operation. And Peter, you know, we heard Prigozhin claiming that the Wagner group has exclusively liberated this suburb of Bakhmut. Uh, those are the words he used, of course, to take full credit. And I want to play more of what he said in this new video. The armed forces of Ukraine work clearly and harmoniously. We have a lot to learn from them. But in any case, the units of PMC Wagner are moving forward meter by meter. So they're moving forward meter by meter. He's claiming full credit. But in there, uh, something significant. We have a lot to learn from them. The armed forces of Ukraine work clearly and harmoniously. He's complimenting them. What is his goal here? Well, I think uh, Evgeny Prigozhin is obviously an oligarch and kleptocrat, which is what in modern day Russia passes for a businessman. But he does not just have pecuniary interests, which has been long speculated that he wants to capture these parts of Ukraine because of the salt mines or the gypsum mines, lucrative parts of Ukraine and its uh, vast resources. Now, by stepping out and in recent weeks also, for example, claiming credit for the Internet Research Agency, which he established in Russia's second city, St. Petersburg, from which Western intelligence claims that the Russians have been sowing discord in Western societies. On top of that, um, he has also bragged about Wagner deployments in Africa, where, for example, in Mali, they have attempted to push out the French or in Syria, where they openly challenged the United States in combat. Now, increasingly, by pushing out, he's becoming much more than just a uh, kleptocrat oligarch, if you will. He is now becoming a political military figure and uh, clearly is aiming at the power structure in Moscow. And I'd say he's doing that in two respects, one through these open 
uh, comments, which he's taking, and the second through sleekly produced videos that um, the Concord Group, which is his public relations outfit, has been releasing of him visiting the front lines, cutting a strong figure, leading his troops, so to speak, towards combat. All of that, I think, suggests a transformation and a real move towards power in Moscow. Well, it's significant when you talk about the business interest. He's got his own PR group, all of this. This isn't just a person <coughs> who has some mercenaries running around that he gets from prisons. I, it's important for people to understand the context and the depth here.